Jesus. Say that with me. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Let's lift up his name today, right here. So let your name be lifted higher.
without me talking to you, without me singing, without anyone else around, just where you are in your words and your heart, you give thanks to the Lord for all that he's done for you, for the price of, of Calvary and the cross, for the resurrection of new life, and all of this, what has he done, and how has he proved himself faithful to you? You spend just a few moments thinking here.
step that Jesus took led him closer to Calvary than his death. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives that events took a dark and ominous turn. Led by Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve who had walked with him for three years and even seen the marvelous works of him, an angry mob seized Jesus, arrested him, and led him away to the high priest. As prophesied in the scriptures, the shepherd was struck and the sheep fled for their lives. The scriptures say in John 18 that a detachment of soldiers, the captain and the Jewish temple police, arrested Jesus and tied him up. First, they led him to Annas, the father in law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Annas, from historical reports, was the high priest during the boyhood of Jesus but had been removed from his office by Pontius Pilate's predecessor. Thus, the office of high priest was no longer a spiritual office, but a political one. In spite of this, Annas continued to wield great influence over the office, most likely because he was still regarded as the high priest, and also because no fewer than five of his sons and his son-in-law, Caiaphas, held the office of high priest at one time or another. Six trials actually occur from this point on until Jesus is led away to be crucified. The first, an informal examination by Annas, probably to gain his own approval and to give time to members of the Sanhedrin to hurriedly gather together in the middle of the night which was against their own laws. From here, Jesus is sent to Caiaphas and eventually on to Pilate, the Roman governor in charge over the Judean province of Israel. Jesus is accused, abused, misrepresented, and sentenced to death. The Sanhedrin gathers and Caiaphas is preparing a trumped up charge that would ensure the guilt of Jesus. Meanwhile, Annas questions Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world. I always talk in the synagogues and the temple, where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely. They know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him on the face, saying, Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? With nothing or no one left to accuse Jesus, Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest where the teachers of the law and the elders had already assembled. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find anything. The many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two men came forward, declaring, this fellow claimed that he could destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, the Sanhedrin said. in an attempt to appear lawful after their previous illegal nighttime trial. 
the religious council convenes again at daybreak to try and sentence Jesus to stand trial before the Roman government. So after trying him again, they bind him and they hand him over to Pilate. And though it is early in the morning, and because it is against Jewish law to enter the house of a Gentile, which would defile them and make them unclean to observe the Passover, Pilate has to come up to them. And as Jesus stands before the governor, the governor asks him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so. Then while standing before Pilate, Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, yet he gave no response. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply to anything, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas, a murderer and a thief. So when a crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Now, Pilate knew it was out of self-interest that the Sanhedrin had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which one of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas! What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Crucify him! Why? What crime has he committed? Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! <laughs> Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Stripped and tied to a post, Jesus is beaten with a weapon often used by gladiators in the arena. A whip loaded with perhaps half a dozen or more leather lashes, each lash embedded with chunks of bone and iron and hooks. The idea was to tear up the victim. The Romans hoped that the war would discourage onlookers from committing crimes. Jesus is beaten. Historical writers who observed crucifixions in Jesus' day wrote they saw these lashes rip open skin and muscle, exposing the victim's bones and intestines. Many didn't make it to the crucifixion. They died at the beating. Thus, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness.
trembled the sun bowed its head the veil of the temple was open for man as Jesus went down in the cold of the grave defeated the darkness with you Exactly what was finished? Something worth pondering? Something worth trying to discover, I think, for ourselves? The crucifixion was just finished. His day was done. His life was finished. Ask ourselves the question on a day like today, when Jesus said, it is finished, what did he finish? We're going to talk about this for a little bit, but I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, if you would. And we're going to read a few scriptures today, and, and it is not my intention to tarry long up here, but I, I, there's some things that I want us to point out today, and some things that I want us to really remember on this day. What did he finish? In the Gospel of John, Chapter 19 is where we are. If you're here today and you do not have a copy of Scripture, I'd love for you to look on with us today. We've got a few in the back. I've got some up here on the front. And there are a few over here on the side. Well, you don't have to give up. Get up and you'll just raise your hand. I'll bring it to you. Or one of our men will bring it to you so you can look on. There you go, right there. One. Anybody else need one? I want you to be able to sit right behind you, Christy. Come here, Christy. Anyone else? We'll bring it to you. There you go. We've got more if you need some. And I want you to see that if you're borrowing one of our copies of Scripture today, it's, it's page 1084. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, lie in the, the kind of the latter third of the Bible. And you'll want to try to discover that as best as what you can there. But uh, Gospel of John, chapter 19, I'm going to invite you to stand with us. We're not going to read the whole passage here, but just a few pieces of it. So we'll get an understanding of where we are. In light of the context of the service today, John 19 and verse 16 picks it up with this. So he, this is Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, handed him, Jesus, over to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And there they crucified him. And with him, two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, which was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but then he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. And the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. And they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing 
They cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Lord Jesus, this is your word. And the Father, this is your plan and your purpose. Spirit of God, speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Very quickly, we're going to just go over a few of these things today. There's not a lot of time to teach fully this whole passage, but there's a few things that we need to discuss today when we talk about what did he finish. First of all, the word that we're talking about today in Greek means to telestai. To telestai. You want to practice that on, on, on me? Ready? Telestai. Not too bad. Not too bad. It means finished. It means paid in full. When Jesus said it is finished, he said to tell us that about a, a year or so ago, my wife was dragging me through the Aubrey Mills Mall, uh, and, and I was following along like an obedient husband and holding bags and sorts of stuff. And, and finally, there was a, a glimmer of interest, finally for me, there was this little kiosk uh, out there in the middle, just outside the food court, and, and, um, and they had all these uh, wood carvings and wood things that were made, and they painted some scripture verses on them. And, and I noticed one that said, to tell us that I'm not a, a great theologian, but I know enough about the word and know enough about the story that I knew what that meant. And it caught my eye, and I went, well, that's different. That's not something you see every day. And then uh, I thought, well, how am I going to, you know, I didn't really want to spend $100 for that plank of barn wood with some paint on it. I thought, well, I can do that. So I took a picture, and for some woodworkers that are here today, I'd like to show you the picture that I've got on here, and, uh, and I'll pay you much less than $100 for it when we're finished. But to tell us that, it's finished, means paid in full, and I so appreciated that. And then I went around the corner, and they had all of these little rubber bracelets that people like to wear. And uh, as a matter of fact, mine broke the other day, and I told Angela, we've got to go back to Upper Mills Mall, and she went, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> no, we went to go shop for an Easter dress, and since mine had broke, I walked out with jewelry, and she walked out with nothing. <laughs> but uh, I don't really consider this jewelry. I consider this a gospel reminder, all right? So there you go. But it says to tell us that, uh, 33 AD, which means that it is finished. It's a great reminder for me. And when people ask me about that weird word that's on my wrist, I had a chance to tell them what it meant. So what did he finish? Let's go quick. Number one is this. Scripture was fulfilled. Scripture was fulfilled. If you look at verse 24, after you write that in your notes today, the soldiers are arguing back and forth whether they should tear his garment or not, as if they were in control of the whole situation. <laughs> what they didn't realize was thousands of years before they were arguing over who should get this, this was prophesied that this was going to happen. Look at verse 24. They said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to what? Fulfill the scripture. Skip down to verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, and to what? Fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. Look at verse 36. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. I would submit to you today that when Jesus said it is finished, he was fulfilling scripture. Not necessarily completing the authorization of scripture, but fulfilling the scripture that had been foretold about him. And no other word was needed. Write that in your words in your notes today because this is important. No other word was needed. No other edict from a king, no other law from a lawmaker, no other word was needed. Jesus finished and fulfilled. Scripture. Secondly, there was a great victory over sin. Back in that day, there must have been a blood sacrifice. There had to be a death to atone for sin. Jesus taking it upon himself, the victory over sin was accomplished.
accomplished. When he said it is finished, he was accomplishing the work. Atonement had been made. The scriptures say in Hebrews that it is impossible. Today, as we know on this side of the crucifixion, on this side of the resurrection, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to, to, to atone or take away our sin. It furthermore says in Ephesians, or in, in Hebrews chapter uh, 10, it says, By this by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Once. Once for all. Look at it. It says, Every priest stands daily ministry, offering time after time and time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Yesterday we had a, a little spring cleaning work day here at the church, and, and we spiffed things up a little bit, and we painted a little, and we pressure washed, and we washed windows, and we vacuumed floors, and we cleaned toilets, and we mopped floors, and we did a lot of stuff in here to, to really kind of spruce things up and, and to do uh, to refresh the building a little bit. And we started about 8 o'clock in the morning, and about 3.30 or 4 o'clock I finally went home, and I sat down. Why? Because my work was accomplished. My task was finished. There may have been other things that other people had to do, but for me, it was over. It was finished. I laid down on my couch, and I died for a little while. <laughs> the work was over. You see, back then, the priest's work was never over. Time after time after time, they were offering sacrifices which could never take away sin. It could atone in the Old Testament. It could cover the sin, but it could never take away the sin. On this side of the resurrection, we realize that Jesus finished the work. He accomplished victory over sin, and he sat down at the right hand of God as if he said it's finished. To tell us that. We see this. When underneath this victory of sin, we also understand that God's wrath was satisfied. Because you see, when we sin, when we break God's law, we've offended God. And we set ourselves up as an enemy of God. And we separate ourselves from God. We have no peace with God. There is nothing but war and enmity with Him. But God's wrath was satisfied. The New Testament word for this is propitiation. Propitiation means a substitute. It is a, it is a satisfaction that this is, has been cared for. Once we were an enemy of God. But praise God, Romans 5.1 says we have peace now with God. In Isaiah chapter 53 it said, It pleased the Lord to crush him, and as a result he will see it and be satisfied. And 1 John says, He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. You see, it was supposed to be us, huh? It was supposed to be our cross. It was supposed to be the whip on our back. We as an enemy of God, God's wrath being poured out upon sin. In Ephesians 2, it says that we were objects. We were children of wrath. We were enemies of God. But now we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because He paid the price for us. Number three today is that He abolished the curse of the law. The curse of the law was abolished. You see, we were born under the law, and the law reveals to us the things that we're supposed to do, the things that we're not supposed to do. The law reveals to us our sinfulness. Why? Because we see perfection, and then we see our imperfection. But you see, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law was there to condemn. The law was there to point out our failure. The law was there to point out, see, you're not as good as what you think you are. Oh, but I'm a good person. Oh, I'm a moral person. Oh, look at all the good things that I do. Oh, look at me. I'm packing my Bible. I'm going to church on Easter Sunday. Look at all this good stuff that I do. And yet we look at the law and understand that we have to be perfect in the law. And when we're not, the law judges us. And the law condemns us. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of this law. And now nothing but grace is needed. Nothing but grace is needed. Number four, the work of redemption has been completed. To redeem us, 
to ransom us, to pay the cost for us. But Jesus said it is finished. The work of redemption was complete. It says in Romans 5, so then as through one transgression, that's Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation. The just penalty for our sin is to be condemned to death. But even so, through one act of righteousness, that's through Christ, there resulted justification of life to all mankind. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says that not through the blood of goats and cats, but through his own blood, he entered into the holy place once for all, having obtained for us eternal redemption. And then in your notes today, I have Ephesians 2. Write this in there for me. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that no one of us may boast. And I can see Paul putting that in the scripture. Paul writing that down. Because he knows mankind. He knows his own heart. He knows how quickly we are susceptible to say. Look what I did. Look at the work that I did. We're so quick to, to uh, applaud science and, and medicine and technology as the fix of all of our woes and, and the fix of all of our diseases and our sins when it is God that has so clearly poured out His grace for us. Say that verse with me, would you? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of the result of works, so that no one may boast. How arrogant for us to think that even for a moment that there's something that we need to contribute to the cross of Christ to make salvation more applicable. That there's something else that we need to do. There's something else that, that we need to bring to the table. How arrogant of us it is. How prideful it is for us to even conceive of the fact that we need to be good enough to do something. As if the cross were enough. You see, we cheapen the work of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus when we continue to add our measure or our merit to salvation. There's nothing good that we bring to the table in this. As a matter of fact, if you turn your Bibles to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. I, I don't have another, any one of them there. For those of you that are part of one of ours, I'll tell you what page is really quick. It's back in the Old Testament. I didn't write this in my notes for you. Isaiah chapter 53. You're borrowing one of our copies of Scripture. It's on page 737. 737 is where we are. Isaiah chapter 53 in the Old Testament. The prophet mentions something that's going to happen many, many years. As a matter of fact, Isaiah was written approximately six to 700 years before Christ. And yet, we see these words from Isaiah. And Isaiah 53 says... He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. In verse 4, it says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for what? Our transgressions. He was crushed for what? Our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we were healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. You see that? The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That is propitiation. That is satisfaction. That is the substitute that Christ was. It was our iniquity. It was our sin. What did we bring to the salvation process? Our sinfulness. The need for suffering. The need for sacrifice. That's all we bring. There is no good work that you do. There is no money that, that you have. There is no good thing that you could possibly do or earn this. We sin. He saves. The work of redemption is complete. And no other work is needed. Number five. Because no other work was needed, it was nothing but grace that was needed. We were redeemed from the curse of the law. Victory over sin had been accomplished. 
and because He was the substitute for us on the cross, the righteousness of Christ has now been credited or imputed to us. The righteousness of Christ, the goodness of Christ, has now been given to us and credited to our account. And only because of this work has access to the Father been granted. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but through me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Because you see, before you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You were once had not received mercy, but because of the work of the cross, you have received mercy. You are a royal priesthood. You can go to the Father. Hebrews chapter 4 says that we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace and find grace and help in our time of need. <clears throat> Access to the Father has been granted because of the work of Calvary. It is finished. Victory over sin, accomplished. Scripture, fulfilled. Curse of the law, abolished. Work of redemption, complete. The veil has been torn. Access to the Father has been given. And no law or legislation, no code or creed or conduct could ever change any of that. It was His work that was done for you. But don't mistake this, this point today because even though the work of Jesus is finished, Jesus is not finished. Jesus is not finished. He was taken from the cross and put into a tomb. But there is more to the story. Jesus laid down his life sacrificially. He laid down his life obediently. He laid down his life out of love for you and me. No man took his life. Don't think for a second that it was Pilate's fault. Or it was the Jewish leader's fault or it was Satan's doing, or it was any of that. And remember we read, it pleased the Lord to crush him. It was God the Father and His love for you that gave His Son. It was the sacrifice and the obedient sacrifice of the will of Jesus to say, I give my life, I will pour out my blood for them. But the story doesn't end there. The morning of triumph begins in the quietness of the pre-dawn love. Mary Magdalene steps out into the chill air and starts walking through the streets of Jerusalem toward Golgotha and the tomb nearby. She comes with spices to anoint the dead body. Since sundown and Friday, she has wanted to be there, just to be near the loved one so violently taken from her to the Sabbath intervening. Other women disciples rose early, put costly spices in their baskets, and they hurried in the same direction. But Mary arrives first. As the first rays of light fill the garden, they fall on the tomb. It yawns open. The stone has been rolled to one side. Spinning on her heels, Mary, rushing past the other women, entering the gardens, is frightened and confused and, and breaks into a dash back in the direction she has come. She must tell Peter and John. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. And now it is Peter and John's turn to run. John, younger and faster, races ahead of his friend in the tomb, but he stops at the entrance. And as he hesitates, Peter rushes past him straight into the tomb. And Mary was right. The body of Jesus is gone. The grave clothes lie in folds with the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, folded, and set aside separately. The fragrance of spice lingers, but that is all. Peter returns to the city to report his findings, wondering to himself, what has happened? But Mary 
Mary stays behind, weeping. Stolen. The body of her Lord has been stolen. Of all the righteous indignities and injuries heaped on their master, this final desecration seems too hard to bear. Alone in the garden once again, Mary looks into the tomb once more. This time, two angels meet her gaze. Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Sensing a presence behind him, she turns, and a man is standing there. Woman, why are you crying? In her desperate state, perhaps averting her eyes, puffy with weeping, she mistakes the man for the gardener. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Then the man calls her by name. Mary. My rabbi. With unspeakable joy, she falls before him, her arms reaching involuntarily around his nail-scarred feet. It's hard to imagine Jesus' tone of voice other than touched with quiet laughter. <laughs> Mary. Just the sound of her name, spoken by the Master, began Mary's own resurrection story. Jesus was not stolen. He was risen. And he had risen for her. The story of Mary and the others who personally encountered Jesus on resurrection morning are among the all-time favorites for Christians. They remind us of hope, of new victory over death, and of joy. But most of all, they remind us of who we are. We belong to Him, and He to us. We are the people of Resurrection Morning, when new life in Christ prevailed over violence and the age of amazing grace began. Yet the grace of Easter arrives quietly. There are no angelic choirs heralding Jesus' return from the grave. No foreign dignitaries arrive bearing gifts. No voice thunders from heaven. The sound of the resurrection are much different. They are much more personal. Muffled voices of dawn. The sound of sandals passing in the streets. Her name hanging in the morning air and Mary's gasp of recognition. Peter and John whispering to each other as they hurry back to town, wondering, hoping, wanting to believe. Three men walking together toward Emmaus talking quietly amongst themselves, two of them heartbroken at the death of a dream, and the third trying to restore their hope. Ten hush disciples waiting in the upper room, fearful, uncertain, what do we do next? And then Jesus appears and simply says, Peace be with you. The resurrection unfolds entirely in a series of intimate conversations between Jesus and his followers. It's all family business now. As he did with Mary, <laughs> Jesus arises and calls each one of us by name. The promise is for everyone who believes and longs for his appearing. There is another side to the resurrection, a far-reaching very destructive side. The tables have been turned. Now violence does not fall upon Jesus. Instead, because God raised him from the grave, Jesus is the one who delivers a devastating blow to the kingdom of darkness. The violence of the resurrection, says Paul, is nothing less than the death of death. Our resurrected and living Say Jesus Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to all who believe. And sometimes, when we least expect it, our risen Lord comes to us. I am the resurrection and the life. 
He invites us to share in his resurrection power and take upon ourselves his righteousness so that we can stand confidently in the presence of the Father. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. And in a gentle voice, he speaks our name and speaks directly to our soul. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Loving Father, thank you for bringing Jesus back from the grave. Thank you for defeating death and darkness by your power. You knew how desperately we needed to be rescued. All our praise and thanks and worship our Lord belong to you. You are the God who saves. You are the God who lives in, our, in your children and gives life to them through your spirit. And risen and conquering Savior, thank you Thank you that you come to find each one of us. You still call us by name, and we follow. Oh Lord, help us to hear and to follow always. Amen. When this perishable body will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality then will come about the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your victory death where is your sting the sting of death is sin the power of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always bound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. You need to hear that today, this Easter. Be steadfast, my beloved brethren. Why? Because of the amazing gift demonstration of grace and mercy that has been poured out for you. Be steadfast. Persevere. Be immovable, unshakable in your faith, knowing that your toil is not in vain. He's paid a great price for you. Oh, death, you cannot defeat me. Oh, death, you have no hold on me. Take me, this mortal body, and watch it become immortality and live in eternity with my loving and gracious Savior. The last enemy to be abolished, says 1 Corinthians, is death. The act of God was to crush him and to raise him. The great news that we have today is that Jesus is alive and he's no longer in the tomb. Amen? Amen. But there's better news than that. What could it possibly be? It says in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in our sins. That we were dead and, and in our transgression against him because we have violated his law and we have broken his commandments. We are now enemies of God and objects of wrath. Thanks be to God because he's given us the victory. In verse 4 it says, But God being rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us. In verse 5 it says, He made us alive with him. Not only do we celebrate the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ this Easter, we also must realize that we were dead in our sins and that we were buried like him in our sin, in our depravity. But thanks be to God, the best news is that I'm going to live with him. 
I'm raised to new life with him, and I will be with him, and I will see him, and I will know him, and I will reign with him forever and ever. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Easter. Look what he finished. Look what he did for you, for me. I'm going to ask you to stand with us at, at Faith Church. We always close with a song. And this song is not just a, a, a closing song. It's an opportunity for you to respond. Maybe you've heard something today. Maybe the Lord is ministering something to you. Maybe he's trying to, to connect his spirit to your spirit. He's trying to tell you something. Would you be willing to listen? Are you able to know and hear his voice? Do you know what he even sounds like? Maybe you need to come to the altar today and say, Lord, forgive me. I've strayed from you. Maybe you need to come to the altar today and say, Lord, save me, for I've never known you. Maybe you need to come and say, I love you. And I want to live for you forever and ever. Because you live, I live. Maybe you just want to come and worship him for that We'll close with this song, and Brian's here, and I'm here. There are other deacons and elders that are that are here, ready to receive and, and to counsel and to pray with you. And we'd love to visit with you. Love to pray with you. Love to, to share the confidence that we have that we can approach the throne of grace. All oh, that he's done. As we sing, you can come. Let's worship together together. Okay? Let's sing this together. There's a peace I love.
service today. We're so thankful that he came. There's some, some new friends and some old friends that are here today that I recognize. I want to thank, thank you for coming and for, for being a part. And for those of you that are family members, for those of you that are brand new, maybe you just pop in off the street or something, and, uh, we want you to know you're welcome here at Faith Church. You're always welcome here at Faith Church, and, and we just are so grateful that, that you chose to worship with us today. You could have gone anywhere. The weather is beautiful. When you leave today, it was chilly this morning, but it's going to be beautiful this afternoon, and so I hope you get to spend some time with some family and some friends today, or, or just go home and crash on the couch, whatever it is that you do in your afternoon, but I don't want you to leave this place today with any kind of misunderstanding or, or anything that we've talked about today that you don't quite get, and, and uh, as always, <laughs> I say this all the time, I want you to really, really understand and get it. If there's something that you have questions about, uh, you can see me at the door, we can talk there, you can write something down, a question on the connect card, but if you would do that, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, we're going to be uh, back here for prayer time on Tuesday morning. Uh, we, we'll have our small group back on Wednesday nights, and, and uh, so we will see and visit with you there. But we love having you here, and uh, we're just grateful that, that you came to us today. So remember, to tell us that it is finished. He has paid the ultimate price for you, one that you never could have done on your own. Let's rejoice in that today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that one day we will rise. Father, we will see our Savior face to face. Father, thank you for the day that is coming for we'll experience no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, no more sickness, no more problems. Father, we thank you that it is finished. That it's been paid in full. And there was absolutely nothing we could do. But it's all because of what Jesus Christ did. <coughs> Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you that he endured the shame, the ridicule, the beatings, the cross for us. Father, thank you that He paid the penalty. He paid it for me. Father, thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. And Lord, as we leave, help us to remember that Easter is not just a one-day event. <coughs> That he is alive every single day that we live. And Father, help us to tell the world of a risen Savior. Of a willing sacrifice. And Father, of a soon coming King. And Father, we pray that we will be ready. That we will be found obedient. For it's in the precious and holy name of our Lord, our Savior, our sacrifice, our King, that we ask. Amen. Amen.